Everyone wants to hear what Warren Buffett has to say. The Oracle of Omaha, building his image and having some fun. Berkshire shares have increased more than 2,000% in value. One of the largest market capitalizations in the world, and it could grow a lot larger since Warren Buffett shows no sign of slowing down. So how did he do it? By investing in what he knows and understands. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'll be studying the greatest investor of all time, Warren Buffett, to see how he chooses his investments and what companies are in his portfolio today. If you enjoyed the video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. So Warren Buffett is widely regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest investor of all time. His rate of return over the last 50 plus years is unmatched, achieving an unbelievable 20% annual return since 1965, compared to just 10% for the S&P 500. Just to put that in perspective over that long a time frame, $1,000 invested in the S&P 500 back in 1965 would have grown to around 250 grand. However, if you invested $1,000 in Berkshire in 1965, it would have grown to over $50 million today. That's the power of compound interest over long periods. Over the years, through his annual letters and the Berkshire meetings, Buffett shared bits and pieces of his investing framework and explained how he achieved his amazing record. It's so well known that Buffett's style is so simple and straightforward that him and Charlie constantly joke that the reason professional investors don't copy their blueprint is it's too simple. Buffett's framework for picking stocks is widely publicized and I've spoken about it on the channel a few times. So just to refresh, the four key pillars of Buffett's investment criteria are understand the business, does the business have a durable competitive advantage, are the management team talented and competent, and is the business at an attractive price relative to its fair value? So today, instead of talking about the pillars themselves, which I've done previously, I want to go between the lines and share some thoughts about how Buffett goes about using this framework when looking at potential investments, and also some cool mental models he uses that can help us as well. Which brings us to the circle of competence. Quite simply, the circle of competence is like an imaginary circle in your mind, and in it contains everything you know and understand, and outside it is everything you don't know and you don't understand. It's absolutely critical to be completely honest with yourself about what you really know and where you have an edge, and more importantly, where you don't have an edge. If you're a really good poker player and you have an edge over average people, it'd be pretty silly to walk into a casino and go straight to the slot machines to play. I was genetically blessed with a certain wiring that's very useful in a highly developed market system where there's lots of chips on the table and uh, you know I happen to be good at that game. Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting and in it he had a uh, picture of himself with bat and the strike zone broken into I think 77 squares and he said if he waited for the pitch that was really in a sweet spot he would bat 400 and if he had to swing at something on the lower corner, he would probably bat 235. And in investing, I'm in a no-called strike business, which is the best business you can be in. I can look at a thousand different companies, and I don't have to be right on every one of them or even 50 of them. So I can pick the ball I want to hit. And the trick in investing is just to sit there and watch pitch after pitch go by and wait for the one right in your sweet spot. And if people are yelling, swing you bum, ignore them. I love the baseball analogy, and I think it explains how Buffett chooses his investments perfectly. In baseball, from my really limited understanding of baseball as an Irishman, you get three attempts to swing at a ball called strikes, and if you get three strikes, you're out. Now, Buffett eloquently explains that investing is very different and there's no called strikes. So essentially, you can sit there and not swing at hundreds or even thousands of stocks until you get one that's right in your sweet spot that meets all your criteria. If you want a high batting average in investing over a long period of time like Buffett, the key is to stay within your circle and be very, very selective about what pitches you swing at. Over time, as you get more experience, you can broaden and expand your circle of competence by learning new things. But as a rule, always invest in something you deeply understand. Now, the batting analogy also works for different parts of Buffett's framework, not just the circle of competence. Warren and Charlie always say, it's better to buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. Yet, the most common mistake I see investors do which I've also done myself and learned the hard way, is buying fair businesses at wonderful prices and swinging for the fences on these mediocre businesses instead of waiting patiently for a compounder. In my last few videos, I've mentioned the forces that need to be at work for a business to be a compounder, like the return on capital employed, the reinvestment rate, and the length of the runway to grow. And it's another example of where we have to be really patient and wait for the perfect pitch that's right in our sweet spot. My biggest investing regret by far was investing in Corsair a year and a half ago instead of Nvidia. 
And the reason I did was because I prioritized the wonderful price of Corsair over the wonderful business of Nvidia. Because I prioritized price over quality, I bought Corsair because it was considerably undervalued and Nvidia was trading a little bit above its fair value. With the knowledge I now have, I have the clarity to see that really, I just bought a mediocre business for a great price and I missed out on a compounder that was trading at a fair price. But I've learned from it and hopefully I won't make that mistake again. Something from Buffett and Munger that I now have drilled in my head is over long periods of time, quality matters way more than price. And in shorter timeframes like five years or less, price matters way more than quality. If you're a long-term business owner like Buffett, quality should matter way more than price. The baseball analogy is important here too, because there's many businesses that seem wonderful and look like compounders, but very few actually are. So being ultra selective and only swinging on sure bets that you're certain are compounders is the way to go. The same thing could be said for the management team as well. There's a saying that when you invest in a business, you're betting on the jockey as much as you're betting on the horse. So you want to be absolutely sure that the leadership team are quality people and their interests align with your own before you swing. One of Buffett's most important criteria is the management team. And he's meticulous about making sure the management team are in his sweet spot before he invests. Yeah, well, we love managers that have a passion for their business. And when we're buying a business, we have to ask ourselves, do they love the money or do they love the business? If they love the money, there's nothing wrong with that. But they probably wouldn't be running the business for us a year or two down the road. I think one difference is that people that create their own businesses, the entrepreneurs probably on average would have a significantly greater degree of passion for those businesses than somebody that was just brought in a few years ago and sees themselves as making a profit in the few years on reselling the business and leaving. I, you'll, you'll find exceptions in both camps, but we've had terrific luck with the entrepreneurs who basically love their businesses the way I love Berkshire. Overall, I think Buffett's framework is extremely successful at finding quality investments, and his record definitely shows it. And at its core, it's incredibly simple, and anybody can mold it to fit their own style. I think the hardest part about Buffett's style is having the patience to sit there and not do anything for long periods of time and not swinging on hundreds of businesses until you get that one business that's right in your sweet spot and meets all your criteria. All right, next up, let's look at Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio to see what Buffett's holding going into the future. Just to save time, I'm gonna focus on Berkshire's stock portfolio and not the businesses Berkshire owns outright, like the insurance companies and Seize Candy. But if you want me to do a full video where I go into how Buffett chooses private companies to buy outright, let me know in the comments below. Okay, so Berkshire has a pretty unique stock portfolio in that some of the holdings weren't chosen by Buffett and were instead selected by Buffett's two replacements, Ted and Todd, who both manage a small percentage of the portfolio. So a lot of the smaller holdings inside Berkshire's portfolio haven't been selected by Buffett, like Activision and Snowflake. Usually Buffett has a pretty concentrated portfolio and he doesn't diversify too much. And it shows with over 80% of the portfolio being in his top six holdings. Buffett's biggest holding by far is Apple, at nearly 50% of the entire portfolio. He started buying Apple periodically from 2016 to 2018 for an average buy price of roughly $36.50 a share. With Apple's current price being nearly $180 a share today, he's made a pretty decent 390% return over the last three to four years, or an annual return of around 50%. Not bad at all for an old dog investing in tech. Next up is Bank of America at 13% of the portfolio, with an average buy price of $26 a share. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. If you have $100 million or more, it makes sense to own dividend paying stocks because of the massive dividend payments. Apple also pays dividends, and just from these two companies, Buffett will net a staggering $1.5 billion in dividends, just in 2021 alone. Imagine getting a billion dollar dividend paycheck every year without fail. Talk about passive income. Next, there's American Express at 8% of the portfolio. This is another dividend powerhouse that Buffett's been holding for well over 10 years, collecting dividends the entire time, and is also sitting on a nice 250% gain. Next is the mighty Coca-Cola, which is one of Buffett's most talked about businesses. This is another dividend stock that Buffett's been compounding for many years, and is currently around 7% of Berkshire's portfolio. It's no secret that Coke's an extremely powerful and popular business. And Buffett knew this back in the 70s and 80s when he started buying shares. And I think all the dividends they've been collecting over the years have more than paid the original purchase price. Next we have Kraft Heinz. And this is the only business in the top six that's currently down from Berkshire's buy price at around a 50% loss so far. Even though it's down considerably, it's another dividend stock that provides a nice dividend income to Berkshire year after year. And finally we have Moody's. 
This is yet another dividend paying stock and by now I'm sure you guys can see the pattern forming here. Moody's has gone on a tear since Berkshire originally bought shares at around $50, all the way up to around $340 a share, a nice 570% return. So that's Buffett's top six holdings, and you can see that it's primarily focused on stable dividend paying stocks that also have some growth potential like Apple. It makes sense when you think about it because Buffett's portfolio is so massive that it would be hard to find an investment that will move the needle that's in his sweet spot. In a lot of ways, it's easier and more secure when you have hundreds of billions of dollars just to dump it all in a safe, stable business that pays a constant dividend. Just from those top six businesses, Berkshire will net around three billion a year in dividends, which is pretty insane when you think about it. Overall, I think we can learn a lot more from Buffett's brain than his portfolio. A lot of what he does wouldn't work as well for people working with much smaller amounts of capital, like myself. And he himself says that Berkshire's often limited by its massive size. But the real beauty of Buffett's framework is that we can mold it to fit our own needs. And all the wisdom and analogies that he generously shares with us are just as relevant to us as they are to him. If you want to learn straight from his brilliant mind, I highly recommend reading Buffett's shareholder letters from Berkshire. There's over 50 years of annual letters there, and they're full of wisdom that really helped me grow as an investor. The baseball analogy is something that I keep in my head every single day, and it's helped me be ultra selective about what businesses to invest in that are in my sweet spot. So that's it for today, and I hope you found this style of video useful. If you've enjoyed the video so far and you want to support the channel, I'd really appreciate if you hit that like button. And if you want to see more videos like this one or join our little community, then hit that subscribe button. And if you're still bored, I'll put another video up in the corner that I think you'll find interesting. If you've watched the video all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching. And as always, this video is not financial advice. Please always do your own research before making any investment decisions. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.